George Kovach here. Uh, grab a coffee, sit back, and relax. It's a VL bougie pearls and pitfalls, a deep dive, and a deep enough dive that I've broken this up into uh, to two parts. So this is the uh, the first part. Just a bit of a historical perspective. There's nothing gum, elastic, or bougie about what is probably more accurately called a, a tracheal tube introducer, but bougie is a term we are all uh, aware of and have grown fond of and we should uh, continue to use. The original one was a reusable, the Eschman tracheal tube introducer, and uh, a lot of people had experience with that, um, felt that it gave a better sort of tactile uh, feedback uh, when you were using it and it held its shape better. But the key aspect of all the bougies are, are the distal tip. So the distal coup de tip holds about a, a 30 degree angle. There's some minor variation between one and the other. But it is an important point because sometimes you will pick up a bougie that might have been stored uh, for some time and it might have lost its, uh, its distal tip, uh, uh, coup de tip angulation. So this is the most important part. Make sure it is there. I am going to focus in on uh, bougie use with uh, video laryngoscopy, but obviously when you're talking about Macintosh laryngoscopy, uh, there, there's significant overlap with uh, uh, bougie use with uh, standard geometry blades. So the focus though is going to be on, on VL use with the, with the bougie. And I've, I've talked and, and done videos in the past on, on Macintosh video laryngoscopy and hyperangulated video laryngoscopy, and you can find these on our website, amairway.ca. Uh, and they will be posted on our uh, YouTube channel. And within these videos, I talk about the do's and don'ts of using uh, Bougie with these various uh, devices. So as I said, I, I'm going to be focusing on standard geometry blade or Macintosh uh, blade video laryngoscopy. This is our algorithm that uh, we use uh, during, uh, have used and using uh, during a COVID protected uh, airway management. And the, and the primary approach that we were suggesting was a Macintosh blade VL with routine use of a, a bougie. Now, uh, I've, I've received a, a lot of email over the past uh, year in, in people saying that they're having challenges when using uh, their, their bougie with VL devices. And that was the motivating factor for putting together um, this, uh, this video. Just a, a note, uh, again, the term video laryngoscopy, it's a very heterogeneous term. And uh, the, the simple way to think of VL is that there are really two types of blades. This is oversimplification, but there are standard geometry blades or Macintosh blades and they're hyperangulated blades. This is, I guess, a, a slide to remember when not to use a bougie. Um, not to use a bougie out of the package, which is a straight device, um, until it's coup de tip with a hyperangulated blade, because a hyperangulated blade is a C around the corner device. And even though this bougie has what I call a pillow bend, it will not work in this scenario, and you will be disappointed. I'll circle back to that a, a bit later. The other thing I'm, I'm not going to talk about in great detail are some of the newer bougies that are out there, more malleable, shapeable bougies, such as the uh, USB that uh, Rich Leviton was behind. And then there's a steerable tip um, bougie that they're starting to, uh, I was starting to see a few publications describing its use. And to me, the ultimate seeing eye bougie is the one on the bottom left, which is using a, a flexible endoscope in combination with your uh, laryngoscope. It's a very potent combination, but it does require um, two people um, with significant skills to uh, do this, uh, do this uh, routinely and, and with high success rate. Again, getting back to when, when you pick, out a, a pick up a, a bougie, remember for the vast majority of them, they're packaged as such. They are straight um, with that uh, distal coup de tip. The problem is, is that people you know, are, are using bougies that they've used in simulation. They're laying around secondhand bougies and almost all of them have a curve on them just from use over time. And then people get used to using them in that way. And then when they pull them out in a real case, they have challenges. So uh, just remember that uh, that subtle difference can be a big one at the, at the bedside. Now, we've been advocating routine use of a bougie since uh, 1999 when we uh, did our first uh, AIM course. 
And the, uh, the classic situation where people would uh, describe success in using the bougie with a, a direct laryngoscope was with a grade three view. So an epiglottis only view, sneaking the bougie underneath it, uh, underneath the epiglottis and then getting feedback, whether that's uh, from clicks or distal uh, hold up and uh, presto, you were in. But uh, again, back in 1999, we were suggesting that you should use it uh, for, for grade two views for the simple reason you see here is that you are able to watch the bougie go in, uh, which is very reassuring, go in in terms of the glottic, go through the glottic uh, inlet. Um, and uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But why not use it for grade one views um, just because it is such an important adjunct that, that you should be skilled in how to use it. So routinely using it allows you then to use it probably better when it's out of routine. Where you really shouldn't consider it, in my view, is using it in a grade four view where you have no anatomical reference point for where the glottic inlet is. Now, I, I recently did a Grand Rounds, uh, because it was Grand Rounds, it was uh, uh, almost uh, 50 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, so uh, something that uh, takes a while to sit, that, sit back and, and watch. But uh, the focus, it was optimizing the dangerouser um, airway in, in dangerous uh, times. And uh, I'm going to reference some of the material I spoke in those Grand, grand Rounds here, because it's, it's very relevant. Uh, you just saw the Cormac and Lehane grade one, two, three, four, um, grading for uh, laryngoscopy. This is the Cook modification of the Cormac Lehane grading. So, in, in his, uh, Dr. Cook's uh, description, he broke them up into easy, restricted, and difficult, easy being grade ones and, and two A's, um, restricted being two B and three A's, and then difficult being three B and four. And I think it's obvious when we look at not the schematic here, but the diagrams, how you can understand how things progressively get more, uh, more difficult. And I'll talk about some of the nuances between the 3A and the 3B um, later. Uh, I, I refer to this slightly different terminology as, as being, I agree that the grade 1s and 2As, which you see, you know, either the full view of the chords or partial view of the chords, should in general be easy. When you can just see... Um, posterior cartilages, retinoids in 2B, or just see uh, the epiglottis, so they are a challenge. In a 3B where your de epiglottis deflected posterior um, behaves more like a, a grade 4 than it does a 3A, and again, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. But the reference to my grand rounds that I, I just uh, uh, mentioned was, was, are these views actually true anatomical views with optimized laryngoscopy, or is there something go else going on that are that are limiting that's limiting your your view? And uh, this is an important point: is that often we forget the, the little stuff. Um, we we forget the the fact that that we have to position our patient, and the way we position our patient um, relates to. How we position our patient relates to uh, their body habitus and, and other, other situations. There's been a lot of, I think, uh, uh, poor or, or inconsistent terminology in describing positioning. And keep it simple. Really what we want to do is sniff to an endpoint of minimum endpoint of ear to sternum. Uh, Tim Cook coined the term flex tension, and, and what he's referring to is, is that in order to either align the axes or flatten the curves, the primary and secondary curves, uh, you need flexion at the cervical thoracic junction, and you need uh, extension at the cervical occipital junction. And the term ramped, I do not think should be used other than, than, than uh, when we're referring to a specific positioning for the obese patient because there are very different definitions of what the word ramped means from a positioning point of view. The purpose of this video, it's gotten a lot of view time on, on Twitter when I was there. Uh, um, and uh, the purpose of this is, is to demonstrate how important that flex tension is, right? The importance of 
of, of positioning your patient. You're seeing dynamic positioning here. And yes, you can put somebody in, in, a, in a sniff to ear to sternum and still lift them a little bit more and, and get additional value. That's why we always say is move your hand to the occiput once you get the laryngoscope in the, in the mouth and see if that's going to augment uh, um, your view further by doing an additional lift. So our purpose when we're using standard geometry or Macintosh laryngoscopy, uh, Macintosh video or direct laryngoscopy, is to get the best glottic inlet view, right, uh, without significant force. And uh, um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about this in, in in a bit more detail. How do we how do we get that? How do we um, get to that endpoint? Uh, this is what we refer to as EVLI, epiglottoscopy, volaculoscopy, laryngoscopy, and intub in intubation. This is optimization for laryngoscopy and intubation, and I've spoken about this uh, um, elsewhere. The term uh, epiglottoscopy um, begins uh, with... Uh, you know, you progressively going in looking for your friend, the epiglottis, is a term Rich Levitin used. But the biggest mistake people do when they're adrenalinized is they go in with a big blade and they essentially do esophagoscopy first um, because they're just going in too forced too forceful with that adrenaline and so you what you want to do is watch that blade tip disappear gradually compressing the tongue um, to look for your friend the epiglottis and then uh, secondarily move it out of the way and the way we secondarily move it out of the way is by doing what what i've referred to as voleculoscopy and i know this might seem like a a, a new uh, a term that has uh, no particular meaning but but i'm going to defend this um here in the next couple slides so we know that the, the best way to move the epiglottis out of the way is to engage the hyoepiglottic ligament, right? As you see here on, on the left. And where the hyoepiglottic lives is underneath what we can see with video laryngoscopy. I'm not suggesting that we go in to see it, but there's the median glossoepiglottic fold that runs from the epiglottis to the posterior aspect of that tongue. And it's by your blade tip being there just at the, at the base of the tongue and the vollecula, you're, you're compressing that hyoepiglottic ligament, which then will secondarily move the epiglottis out of the, out of the way, and voila, you see... Uh, um, you'll be able to see your, your glottic inlet. Voleculoscopy, this part, it's a game of millimeters, right? So if you lift too early, right, um, you're, you're not going to move that epiglottis out of the way if you lift at the base of the, of the tongue. And I really think that this is the difference between uh, somebody who's experienced and has expertise and somebody who doesn't. In other words, you, somebody's going in and they're doing laryngoscopy and they can't get a good view. And then somebody on that same patient with the same device gets a beautiful view. Um, and uh, it's because people are using excessive force um, and they're not, they're not able to adjust um, their fine motor control to just engage that hyoepiglottic ligament at the base of the vollecula underneath that median glossoepiglottic fold. Um, so this is an example of uh, what you'll see is the median glossoepiglottic fold up top. And what you're going to see is the, the glottis, essentially everything shake here for force that's happening at the base of the tongue and nothing happens, right? So there's a fair bit of force there, but the epiglottis isn't moved out of the way, right? But that's, that's where the hyoepiglottic ligament lives. And that tells you that, okay, I need to be down there further to engage that ligament and move it out of the way. So again, here, cross-sectional and anatomical cross-section, if I lift prematurely at the base of the tongue, nothing happens to move the epiglottis um, away. And in that same way, if you go too far with your blade um, beyond the base of the, uh, of, of the vollecula or, you know, ride high on that uh, uh, medium glossoepiglottic fold, what you'll do is deflect that, that epiglottis posterior and you'll create a, a, a 3B view. And these are extraordinarily hard to manage. And, and I don't think that they're that common and that the most common cause is something is, e, is a iatrogenic cause is from you actually deflecting that epiglottis uh, posteriorly.
So what it looks like is before you saw the same video where they're prematurely lifting and it wasn't moving out of the way and you just drop it down a couple millimeters and without any force, this can happen with two fingers, you can get this uh, um, great view. So fine motor control is what you need and that's what you're going to see here again. A premature lift does nothing and then all the blade tip has to do is engage that hyoepiglottic ligament and then voila, the epiglottis uh, moves out of the way and you're going to get a nice view of the glottic inlet. Right, so for laryngoscopy and particularly standard uh, geometry or Macintosh laryngoscopy, whether it's video or, or direct base, um, the better the view, um, the, uh, the uh, better your chances are of, of placing an endotracheal tube. And this is different than hyperangulated use VL, right? And I've talked about that in the other video that I talked about hyperangulated VL, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but with Macintosh or standard geometry laryngoscopy, the better view correlates with a better tube delivery. So now we talk about epiglottoscopy, voleculoscopy. Now, how do we augment laryngoscopy so that we can intimate with a high first pass success rate? We call this three, two, one. Three things to do with two hands on first attempt, right? So you should be psychologically preparing um, with, with every case, what am I going to do? What's my difficult laryngoscopy drill that I don't have to employ because that's what I'm going to do every time. And really what it means is using your right hand to help your left hand in terms of laryngoscopy. So the first thing we said, even if we've got the patient in a sniffing ear to sternum positioning, we can do an additional head lift to see if that does anything better. And, and we can slip towels underneath it, or we can then reach around ourselves and do ELM, external laryngeal manipulation, and then reach for the bougie without uh, leaving view um, in the mouth or on the screen and, uh, and, and place a, a, a bougie as you see here. So three things to do. Uh, with two hands on, on first attempt, we should train to do all of those. Often we forget about the little stuff. Now, when I showed that, uh, that head of elevation video or Sam Galley um, had posted this uh, with, with tons of, of views, uh, and a lot of people were sort of saying, well, what are you supposed to do now, you know, that you've got your right hand underneath the occiput? My answer to that is, is that, you know, uh, I'm, I, you need more than than your hand to do uh, laryngoscopy, whatever technique you're using. So to me, I, even though I call it three, two, one, sometimes I need, um, I need uh, um, you know, two hands, sometimes I need three hands, sometimes I need four hands to, to help you with that laryngoscopy. So yes, when you do a head lift and you get a better view, then somebody's gonna slip towels underneath that. You've got them prepped to do that and to maintain that height. You know, if you reach around and do ELM successfully yourself, then you're going to put somebody's hands there and guide them, and they're going to keep them there. You need extra hands to help you place the bougie. So, yes, you need ex additional help um, to do all these things successfully. Yes, they can be done alone, but uh, that's not what we were suggesting. So, again, three, two, one, head lift, ELM, and uh, bougie use. So, let's get back to the, the uh, cook... Um, um, modified uh, Cormac Lehane um, scoring. So it, we agreed that ones and, and two A's are, are easy. What, what are the what most common reason for um, not being successful for the ones that are challenging or as I list here, the OMGs, oh my goodness type of uh, views. And as I said before, I, I really think that the most common cause overall um, is 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 us in terms of users, and we're not we're not optimizing our approach. And therein lies, you know, the the critical features of of laryngoscopy and intubation, as outlined in terms of EVLI. I can I think I can predict who's going to be successful and who's not if I were to just feel their 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 forearm and feel the amount of tension that they're putting when they're performing laryngoscopy. And somebody's got a lot of attention, a, a lot of sort of tension and adrenaline and force. You cannot do fine motor control. You're gonna slip and slide forward um, and, and not be able to sort of engage that tip in the way that you need to. So it takes practice and it takes practice and you shouldn't need a whole lot of force um, to do proper uh, laryngoscopy and ultimately intubation. 
Now, uh, if you look back at the the, uh, the study that has gotten a lot of attention regarding bougie use, it's the it's the driver study. So the, the JAMA driver study it was a it was a randomized uh, um, study in which they're comparing routine use of a bougie um, with a stylated endotracheal tube. And what was was clear from there is that uh, this this group of, of eMERGE docs, they, they had a 98% first pass success rate. 98% first pass success rate. Tremendous. And very, very impressive. And the patients that had predictors of difficulty, it was, it was 96%. So... You know, everybody's sort of saying, you know, bougie, 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 um, that's the way to go. And I'm, I'm going to say bougie, bougie, bougie. But the reason why they were successful, in my mind, and they had this, it was part of their airway bundle. This is a group that was committed to airway management uh, and part of this study, um, too. But, uh, and they had a lot of experience with, uh, with bougie use preceding this. And they were essentially, they, they were doing Macintosh video laryngoscopy and performing an RSI. So it's this airway bundle that was giving this 98% uh, first pass success rate. It wasn't just the bougie versus um, stylet, right? So there are other factors there. But this is an important message. If you want to be good at what you do, then you should have an airway bundle to achieve high, pass first, high first pass success rate as they did in this study. So when 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 to use a bougie? I don't think there's any debate. Um, certainly for the challenging cases, you know the the two B and again a two B is really you're just seeing a retinoids or posterior cartilages, maybe intra retinoid notch, and then the three A in which you see the epiglottis is deflected up towards you. Those would be the classic scenarios in which people would uh, use a uh, um, a, a bougie. Now, with a 3A, and I'll talk about this a, a little bit more, um, this was historically probably the most classic scenario where people would, would do it, and um, they'd have a, a reasonably high success rate compared to stylet use um, because of, of the positioning of that epiglottis-only grade 3 view, which I'll talk about in a minute. So classic scenario in which you look into the mouth and you might just see this and you're essentially you're riding that coup de tip around the posterior aspect of that, caressing the posterior aspect of that epiglottis, um, hoping it's going to slide into the, uh, the glottic um, inlet. And many people will think that they, they don't need to use it if they see you know, some aspects of, uh, and I can't argue with people not using it for grade ones um, and even grade twos, but uh, I, I think given the, the data in the driver study that I'll present a little bit more detail, um, we can, we can uh, feel comfortable in advocating for routine use in that scenario. So in the two A's um, and in the, uh, in the uh, two B's uh, for sure. So classically it was the the three A's, but uh, certainly the two B's and even the uh, two A's. And, and if we look at the evidence from the driver study, not so surprisingly, uh, the most significant effect was seen in the grade three views, 96% when routine use of bougie compared to 40% with the styleted and tracheal tube. But the uh, grade three views didn't... Uh, there weren't, there weren't as many as there were grade two views. So proportionally, the biggest effect of this study was really in the grade two views. So 97% with the bougie compared to 66% with the styletic group. And the reason for this, as I'll, I'll show in a subsequent slide, is that you watch the bougie go in as opposed to the endotracheal tube obstructing your view uh, near the end. 99% uh, compared to 96% in the grade one view. So there was still some benefit over a bougie versus stylet in this, in this uh, group, but uh, not nearly as much as it were, as it was in the other two uh, grades as I just described. And then grade four, as I said, it's, it's really not something it's advisable to do when you have no anatomical reference point. So grade two, grade two views, whether it's a 2A or, or 2B, why should we uh, um, use the bougie again? If you look grade twos all all together, ninety seven percent with the routine use of a bougie versus sixty percent with the stylet. And the reason why the stylet and tracheal tube was failing this often is because, as you can see, that as the tube approaches the glottic inlet, you lose view 
of the cords of that glottic inlet as opposed to when you use a smaller diameter um, adjunct such as the bougie you watch it go in right uh, you don't obstruct your your view um, and then once you're in and you watch it go in um, then it's uh, simply uh, placing your endotracheal tube over that bougie and away you go so many people will, will, will ask is are these numbers these 98 percent 96 percent is this uh, is this something that we can all expect and there's no question that there's some there's some study effect here and the fact that this was at an experience center um, and that it was experienced with bougie use um, but it, it wasn't just the bougie that was bringing the uh, the value it was the fact that it was part of an airway bundle and if we want to improve our first pass success then all of us should have an approach a common approach an airway bundle um, to help us achieve that that goal so a when and when not to uh, um, to to bougie let's let's focus I, I we just finished talking about the two a's and and two b's what about grade threes and, and grade fours well first of all let's look at the uh, at the incidents it's uh the grade uh, more difficult views in particular grade three views and grade four views are more common in the emergency department compared to the uh, um, the operating room and uh, I'm not going to get into uh, details as to why that may, may be there's no question that it, uh, it's going to be related to uh, to skills um, and uh, other things such as as environment but let's look at grade threes because that's uh, that's uh, something you need to understand anatomically so What's the difference between a 3A and 3B view? Well, it is the world of difference at the bedside. So a 3A view is they're both epiglottis only views, but a 3A view, the epiglottis is deflected up towards you. You've engaged that, that hyoepiglottic ligament. You're compressing that uh, median glossoepiglottic fold and the epiglottis is tilting up towards you. You still can't see any of the glottic inlet, but you can slide the epiglottis, slide your uh, uh, bougie in underneath that, as opposed to a 3B view, in which the, the epiglottis is, is deflected posteriorly against the posterior pharyngeal wall. And think of this as sort of a, almost a closed door to your, your glottic inlet. And uh, your coup de tip isn't going to be um, steep enough or acute in an angle enough to really manage that. So with a 3A view, um, you can manage it with the coup de tip. With a 3B view in that deflected um, epiglottis, epiglottis deflected posteriorly, you really can't manage that. Now, some people have described success with that by using the bougie to pick up the epiglottis. Uh, and uh, uh, but in general a 3b view behaves more closely to a grade 4 view in terms of success rate now i contend that the most common reason for a 3b view is the user and their their blade tip and their voleculoscopy uh, isn't isn't going so well and they've probably got a tense forearm and uh uh, too much force that they they're not engaged in that hyoepiglottic ligament and compressing that median glossoepiglottic uh, fold as uh, stated um, I don't want to spend any more time on this uh, three B views are, are uh, things that should cause anxiety and and are oh my goodness uh, very 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 difficult uh, airways if they are truly uh, anatomically grade three B views and behave in a similar way to a grade four view and remember that uh, um, try not to make the cause of a 3B view being you in terms of uh, your blade tip uh, not doing proper voleculoscopy as I've talked about previously um, in, this, in this scenario. Uh, Cormac uh, Lehane grade 4 views are, are, are very uncommon uh, and less than 1%. And if you have a higher rate than that, uh, um, there might be something else going on. Uh, I think... Um, that one of the common uh, visuals of a, of a grade four view, or they're called a grade four view, is they're actually people are looking in the esophagus. But uh, again, I've got no data to back that uh, back that up. All right, so uh, back to uh, bougie um, for sure. Um, evidence supports two A's, two B's, and three um, A's. Um, you can use it in grade ones uh, to keep your experience. Um, really whole not a whole lot of literature support using it in 3b views and i wouldn't use it in a grade four 
All right, so uh, this is enough for uh, for part one. Part two is going to be all about bougie mechanics. Uh, so um, how we can optimize its use. And again, the focus is going to be with uh, video laryngoscopy and where things will uh, potentially go wrong. So some stuff to uh, look forward to in, in part two coming up.